So I was going to make a video about railroading, linear campaigns, and Kandala Obscura based on something I saw on YouTube, and I thought it was going to be this really interesting discussion, but the YouTube video I was going to base that video off of, I kept on watching it, and I checked out some of the guy's other videos, and I saw something along the lines of, toxic masculinity is needed for good Dungeons and Dragons, and I thought to myself, I deal with enough cringe on a day-to-day -day basis, I think I'm good, so we're doing something else! Today, we're gonna be talking about house rules. Last time we did this, we talked about bad house rules, but this week, we're talking about good house rules. House rules that save you time, save you energy, and make GMing generally easier. We're gonna be pulling these from Reddit, and pulling some from my own patch notes, giving you guys a little preview into my own game. Finally brave enough to do this. Hopefully, you consider these good house rules, and hopefully they help you out even in small ways. So yeah, without further ado, guys, let's get started. Alright, let's start out with one from Reddit. Your characters need to be tied into this world. Not necessarily a house rule, but instead a really good habit for any game where roleplay is a focus. I run a pretty roleplay light game, but even for me, I use this rule. In my game, I built around a faction system that my players have. They can either have a background, or they can have a faction. And many of my players got kind of attached to the factions that they picked. Most notably is Shanks, our barbarian who joined the Straw Hats. Yes, apparently it's a reference to some anime I have never watched. If you point it out in the comments, you will be banned for life. I'm mostly kidding, but anyway, yes, <laughs> Shanks the Barbarian joined up with a faction called the Straw Hats, and he has grown mysteriously extremely attached to them, even though they've only met a couple times. It's probably mostly because of the anime thing, but it's also because he made that choice. He wanted to join this faction, anime reference or not, just because he thought it would be cool, and now he has a connection to this group. His character is trying to make his way back to them, make his way back home. Even in a roleplay-like group, that story, it's pretty dang neat. So yeah, I think that this piece of advice works in lots of different types of games. I'm gonna tack on an adjacent piece of advice, and that adjacent piece of advice is that your characters need a reason to join up with the party as well. That first piece of advice is mostly your characters need a reason to be in this plot, they need to be tied to this world, blah 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 blah, but it's also important for the party to have some level of cohesion. If a character doesn't feel like they would actually join up with the group, then you need to suspend a lot of disbelief in order to tolerate having that character around. Now, there are ways for the GM to help with this. A great example is what Baldur's Gate 3 does. Plenty of characters in that game have zero reason to join up with each other, but through the tadpoles in your brains, you do have a reason now. You are all trying to get a cure. You have a shared goal, and therefore, you join up together. But the players can also help the GM out with this by making characters that have a reason to join up with the party and actually go on the adventure. All right, next up, one from me. Organize out your stat blocks between sessions. All right, so what do I mean by this? I have folders labeled Aberration, Undead, Humanoid, etc. that organize out all of the stat blocks I use in my game, primarily from Flea Mortals, but there are a few official monsters and a few monsters that I myself have created sprinkled throughout there, and this is the greatest thing I have ever done. This makes encounter building a breeze. Obviously, reading through Flea Mortals and actually taking in all the monster stat blocks and using that book for over a year at this point has really helped me to acclimate myself to the monsters and how they're balanced in combat, but having them organized out like this just makes putting them into my notes so much easier. Yes, I understand I could just use the PDF of the book, but doing it like this gives me easy access to whatever monsters I need. Do I need an Aboleth? Boom, Aberration folder. Do I need a human? Go to Humanoid, click on the Human folder, and boom, you have humans. It is nice and simple. Doing this has saved me so much headache. In fact, just in general, I would recommend having folders like this for whatever content you use in your game. Whether you're an online DM or an in-person DM. I do have a giant binder full of map assets for my in-person games whenever I run those, which is very rare. 
and I also have neat organized color-coded folders for all of my online games as well. Not only does this make the organization nerd in me very happy, but also it's just a convenience. It's a couple hours of work that's going to save you many more hours of time later on. It is so nice. I cannot recommend it enough. Okay, less of a rule and more of a thing I do. Notifying the next character they are on deck. I also do it towards the end of a player's turn. If a player is thinking about what to do on their turn. This is something Matt Mercer does in Critical Role, and as a massive Critical Role fan, this is something I have never done, and good golly, I need to start. The amount of times players delay is getting to be pretty rare at my games. My players are usually on the ball when it comes to their actions, but there are times where they simply do not know what to do, and our combats get pretty intense when it comes to initiative order. Tons of minion hordes and brutes and leaders coming at them with all different sorts of abilities and reactions and etc. And it becomes a lot. Sometimes you can lose track of where you are in initiative, especially since as a dungeon master, I am uniquely god-awful at keeping track of the initiative tracker to, to make sure that whoever's turn is highlighted by the program. I'm terrible at it, truly. But... If you are able to let a player know, hey, your turn's coming up next, you're on deck, that is going to give them that little bit of time to focus up, lock in, and figure out what they want to do. I would also recommend trying to figure out how to use some sort of initiative tracker, whether you're an in-person game or an online game. When I was in person, we used a whiteboard and a designated initiative person to just call out whoever's next, which was really nice. It was never me. It was always a player who just had a little bit of extra brain space to do so. So that's great. In Foundry, there's an initiative tracker on the side of the screen that the GM can use. I never use it because again, uniquely terrible at it, but it is also very helpful for keeping that in mind. Ping systems like this as well, also very helpful for making sure that your players know not only when their turn is, but also where they are on big maps. Very nice. Another one for me, play stat blocks in the middle of your notes. Okay, this is gonna sound weird, but this is a note taking thing. So obviously very subjective, very much depends on who you are and how you take notes but just a couple of note-taking habits that have helped me as a game master. First and foremost, when I'm putting stat blocks into my notes, for as long as I have GM'd, so over half a decade now, somewhere along those lines, I put my stat blocks at the bottom of my notes. So notes for the session, and then stat blocks at the bottom. I used this for so long and never even thought twice about it, but looking back, this is a terrible system. The main issue is, if, for example, an encounter happens and it's at the top of my notes, it's on page one, I need to scroll all the way down to the bottom of my notes to find the stat blocks. And then for any actual combat notes, I have to scroll all the way back up to the first page for any sort of combat battle flavor I want to add in, any roleplay encounters that happen during combat, any notes I have on how the monsters act. I have to scroll all the way back up to get to that, and then when I need the stat block again, I have to scroll all the way back down it's a bad thing especially as a person who is really bad at reading if you can believe it so yeah last week i had a very intense combat session two experimental combats a boss fight and a horde fight where the challenge was turned up way high i wanted to really make my players sweat this session we hadn't sweated in a hot minute and i wanted this one to be intense and therefore I also want to change up the way I take notes so I could be ready for this because my current system, the system I was using, was not working. So I instead am now putting my stat blocks just wherever they're needed. If the encounter happens on page one, the stat blocks are on page one. They're all together now. Why I haven't been doing this the whole time, I do not know. But during that session, again, one of the most intense combats I've ever run, near TPK level, this was the best thing I've ever done. Having the stat blocks available for me just to look at with all of my other notes right there was very, very convenient, and I cannot recommend this enough. You are all probably already doing this if you are a note takey person because it's obvious, but I didn't realize it. So if anyone else out there, if you are like me and put your stat blocks at the bottom of your notes, stop. Try putting your stat blocks in the middle of your notes where they're appropriate because it saved my butt, trust me. Okay, next up, one from Reddit. Can't use the help action if you aren't proficient in the skill you are helping with. I thought that's just how it worked. I didn't realize that was a house rule. It may just be rules as written, but I do know GMs that don't do that. 
I don't like help spam in a similar way. I don't like guidance spam. It does get kind of annoying. I don't harp on this to my players, but I feel like they are aware of it since they almost never use guidance. And at this point, they're using the help action less and less, which I'm trying to discourage. I do want players to collaborate in this way, but I want it to be a little bit more than guidance. Oh, help. I want there to be more, you know, I don't know, a little more nuance than just that. This is a good way to at least fix the help problem. When you have a skill that you are proficient in, that is when you can give a helping hand. The point is that yes, I do agree with this feature, especially if it's for important roles. Though sometimes, I'm not gonna lie, sometimes I let it slide. Help actions aren't the worst thing in the world, and they don't usually get obnoxious at a table. It has become a problem in the past, it was a problem in my second campaign, but here, my players are a little bit better with restraining themselves and being a bit more realistic with what their characters can help with, usually by sticking with their proficiencies. Next up, one from me, and this is a very personal one, so keep in mind that I don't expect everyone to do this, but I have removed stunned as a condition and replaced it. So, stunned as a game master is just such a pain to work around. Even something like getting petrified. At least most petrification effects, they're over time. You know, you gotta roll a couple fails before you get there. Getting downed at zero hit points, yeah, you get your turn skipped, but you need to go all the way to zero hit points, and unless your DM is running a thousand things with power word kill, you're probably gonna have at least a couple turns before you're downed. But stunned? One failed saving throw and you are down for the count. As a player, that just sucked. I'd stunned a player character one time and it felt so terrible. It felt like crap. I was just skipping their turn and as an effect, it did not land. It wasn't like, oh no, I'm stunned. What are we going to do? I'm starting to sweat. It was more like, oh, I'm stunned. Cool. They didn't even lose that fight. It wasn't even really a challenging combat. It was just annoying. And as a game master who's running monsters, getting monsters stunned and balancing around that, it is also very annoying. I mean, I have to balance all my encounters around the possibility that one failed saving throw is going to knock out a solo boss. I mean, now I have to institute adds into every single fight, tons of trash monsters everywhere just to absorb any sort of stun conditions the party throws against them, etc, etc. And I understand that this might be a skill issue. You know, this is probably a me problem. I know many GMs who run games where stunned is a thing and it's perfectly fine fine. But Jacob to XP level 3 has also ranted about how stunned sucks, and so that definitely validated me. I do not like stunned. He does neither. He does a much better job at explaining it than I ever could. But my point is that I have removed stunned and replaced it with dazed. Now, dazed is an in-progress 1 D&D feature, which is subject to change. So this is my dazed, I guess. It's basically a lesser version of stunned. The character can take their action. They have zero movement, no bonus action, and no reaction. They can use their action dash to get their movement back. This is still a major penalty. However, it's not such a penalty that it's impossible to work around. For example, casters or ranged attackers that get stunned, they are probably going to be fine. Like, yeah, they can't move, they can't use their bonus action, so that might ruin someone who wants to cast Hunter's Mark, for example. However, for melee attackers, this could be a big ol' wall up to them. I mean, now they can't chase after their enemy, and they can get easily surrounded. They can still play the game, they can still attack, they can still strategize with the other players, however, they just can't move. However, they are just more restricted in what they can do. It's a restriction, not a complete cancellation. That's why I don't like stunned, and that's why I prefer dazed. Another thing I'll talk about, a little side thing to this, but saving throws are not the only way that effects can be dealt to player characters. This is something I really like about Flea Immortals. Sometimes, status conditions happen if a player is hit by every attack in a multi-attack, for example. Look, forcing player characters to make three different saving throws is one thing, but it can just become a pain in the butt. I like Flea Immortals because, for example, if a player gets hit by all three attacks from this orc boss, they are dazed. Simple and easy. First and foremost, this allows conditions to actually be a part of the fight, but also incentivizes players to actually have high armor classes. Sometimes it feels like my players are just absorbing attacks with their face, Rocky style, whereas I want to reward players who want to dodge attacks, Creed style. So yeah, there you go. Two pieces of advice to hopefully help you out with status conditions and explaining why I really don't like stunt. 
Last up, metagaming is allowed, poor sportsmanship is not. Agreed on this one. Metagaming is not something that my players and I harp on, especially if metagaming will lead to an interesting roleplay interaction. Recently, a player character happened to come across this girl that they recently saved, and she is trying to find a new name. She's trying to come up with a new name for herself because the name she had was a pseudonym, a nickname given to her by an abusive father figure, so she wants a new one. The player that happened to find this encounter, the Barbarian, didn't really have all that many ideas and also didn't have that many girl names off the top of his head. But the Bard, she had plenty of ideas. And she was the one who was so gun-ho for talking to this girl, for helping this girl, for saving her in the first place. It was just unfortunate she happened to not be the one that chose to talk to her first. It was the barbarian instead who just went, oh, whatever, I'll talk to her, and happened to encounter a roleplay interaction that he wasn't really ready for. The bard wasn't in the room, but through metagaming, I allowed her to just go, Oh wow, I happen to stumble into this conversation. Guess I'm a part of it now. The barbarian certainly didn't mind. He wanted the help, and the bard was happy to have this roleplay interaction with a character she liked. I didn't restrict the interaction because, oh, it's technically metagaming. The bard doesn't know this has happened. She's not in the room. No, I just allowed her to be there because it's more interesting. Now, metagaming that affects the game in some other way that's more than just cool flavor is different. For example, if two player characters are talking about, hey, our vampire bard is uh, kind of suspicious, don't you think? I don't let the bard just metagame her way into that conversation and go, hey, what you saying about me? Yeah, none of that, okay? That's that's just not gonna work. Metagaming that's used to affect combat balance as well, that's also not the play. Though I will say, on the other hand, DMs who don't let their players strategize even a little bit between sessions or even during combat, I don't like that either. Like, these characters can talk to each other, and there's enough nothing sandwich going on between turns. You can at least let your players talk to each other. Come on. I understand it's metagaming and affects the combat, but it affects the combat in a cool way. The players are having more fun. But yeah, the point is, I don't like metagaming as much as the next guy, but sometimes it is helpful. Choose what hills you want to die on. What kind of metagaming is worth getting hot and bothered about, and what kind of things you should just let slide. All right, so that's the end of that video. I feel like this one's kind of misleading. These weren't really house rules. Most of them were just habits, but I hope these good DMing habits helped you in some small way. If you guys enjoyed, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of my content, then you can check out our RPG Horror Story series where we talk about the best of the worst of Dungeons and Dragons and all TTRPGs, it's in the cards. And while you're there, subscribe to Crispy's Tavern to get more of our content as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own tips or thoughts, go down in the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment good rules to let me know you made it to the end of the video. In essence, like, comment, subscribe. I will see you all next time. Farewell.